the Shang Dynasty, 16th century BC until 1046 BC. This is the first moment when the China comes out of the darkness because the Shang Dynasty is the first one in history that actually um, is, is described by the written sources. And we have several different uh, chronicles talking about Shang kings. We are in a central part of China, in the Henan province, at the coast of the Yellow, uh, the Yellow Sea. At that time, um, the Shang kingdom was one of many. It's not actually a really kingdom in a European sense. It's a statelet. It's a more advanced form of statal organization. The rest of China, the one you don't really see on this map, is heavily inhabited by myriads of other statelets. So why the history of Bronze Age China starts in Shang Dynasty? Because the Shangs are the first one who are actually using written uh, inscriptions. So we can track back the organization of the state to the oracles. In the corner you see the, the so-called bone oracles. This is very typical artifact found in Chinese archaeology of the Bronze Age. The, the shells of the turtles were basically covered with the first forms of the Chinese characters. And these are magical spells. And, uh, uh, and they've been basically taking all these bone shells, they've been burning them in the fire, and the shaman or the king was supposed to read the god's will from, from the fumes of, of, the, of the burnt shells. But some of them, were, they were preserved in them thousands of, of examples. And from the texts on these bones, we can actually start to to see what they are actually doing in, um, uh, in that uh, time period. Majority of the spells is pretty trivial. Gives me more wine, give me more beautiful woman, but still it gives you an information. There's the wine consumption, and you can start writing your habilitation about that. So the city-state was the city called, uh, called Guoying um, in the ancient uh, language, but today we call it Anyang. There's a massive ruins uh, in, in there, and we know from the, from the chronology that it became the city of the Shang around 1300 uh, BC. In general, in uh, Chinese archaeology, there is a massive problem with dating of early Chinese dynasties. Um, the first dynasty, the Dynasty Zero, as we would call it, is Xia. I'm going to come back to that. This is the end of the Neolithic. But uh, there's a lot of written sources, but the dates, according to the written sources, do not really match the radiocarbon dating. So in the Chinese literature, you may have a problem of double dating. Sometimes you can see a certain event happening, the king, and you have four different dates, but they're all referring to the same problem, because according to the written sources, uh, the foundation of the, uh, of the Anyang was, uh, the, the end of the Shang dynasty was 100, um, uh, 1,122, but after correlation with some um, astronomical events like supernovas and uh, um, eclipses, it was correlated that, in fact, it represents 1,045 uh, 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 or 46. This is the Battle of Muria where the Shang dynasty has been beaten. And this is the stable moment when we start to reconstruct who was after whom on that list of, of kings. Chronological outline, just to, just to be clear where we are. Neolithic in China, 8,500 until 2,000 more or less. In different areas, it develops differently. The first dynasty we've heard of is the Xia. We are still in a, uh, there is a still ongoing debate regarding what Xia really was and what form it functioned. But we know for sure that around 1,600, uh, uh, 1, the Shang dynasty appears and we start to have the flows of, of the written evidence. After that, after the defeat of the Shang in 1046 at Muya battle, uh, we have the following dynasty, Zhu dynasty, who actually fought Changs and they destroyed them completely. But from archaeological perspective, we, we have two major archaeological cultures. The first is Evlitu culture, dated to 2000 uh, until 1500. That culture has four sub-periods, so it follows pretty much the same like we in Europe. Uh, and every two culture is thought to be associated with that late Neolithic transition to Bronze Age, to, with Xia dynasty. So in tombs we have clay, bronze, uh, early Bronze Age objects, um, uh, lacquered coffins, uh, animal bones, and for the first time in every two culture we have Ren Xun, 
a habit of Rangsun, which is fairly typical for the Bronze Age China. This is the habit of human sacrifices and mass scale. We are not talking about 10 people, we are talking about people, nobility being buried with, with the mass graves of 200, 400 slaves. So we are looking at fairly developed slave-based <coughs> economy, a slave-based society. The second culture, um, Erkigand culture, is called early Shang. And the thing about um, Erdogan culture is that the Shang dynasty, and we know that from the written sources, they had to change capitals several times. So within that, we have sub-periods when the Shang has to move a capital from uh, the first city where the capital was located was Ao. But the, later on, they moved to Ying, and later on, they come back to Ying, and so on. So, so there are different sub-phases, and um, early Erdogan culture is dated 1,600 till 1,400, more or less. The funny thing about this culture is that in the early Shang period, we don't have nobility graves. But we do have evidence of the copper and salt trade, because the thing about the Bronze Age in China is that they, they have no limitations like in Europe. They don't have problem with tin. Tin is available in a whole country. So we are going to see alternative vision of the Bronze Age where the tin was never a problem. Shang Dynasty in brief, just the headlines. First world cities, built on a very uh, regular <coughs> grid pattern. Those cities um, are large, admini uh, large administra uh, administration centers and ritual centers. Rulership passed only in the main <coughs> line. And that will become a tradition in China that the ruler can be only male. And there is absolutely no exception, even later on in Han Dynasty. Uh, imports of domesticated horses and chariots and mass. Shang kings maintained the huge armies with the, uh, the bands of 300 chariots per army, so that they go really big. The development of Chinese scripture, the development of Chinese calendar system, which was based on a 10, 10 days week. But this calendar system was used in a very specific way because Shangs needed calendar only to perform their favorite action, divination, and fortune-telling. And this is the thing about the Bronze Age. The Shang kings are not the kings in our sense. In the Chinese tradition, the king is uh, in that time is perceived as a holy person, a vessel, who is supposed to communicate through the oracles with the ancestors. So what the Shang, uh, Shang kings did, they were basically listening to the ancestors and telling people what to do. And that was pretty much the the mechanism behind power. Production of bronzes, I'm not going to go into that. Uh, the Chinese bronzes are different in that sense that they are all casted. There is no hammering comparing to European bronzes. Intensive silk production and wine production. Bronze Age China is drunk. And this is the picture that goes through the history of China through centuries later on. Uh, in the Han Dynasty, the chronicles were depicting a very uh, uh, the, the bad kings of Shang dynasty, adulterers, drunk, uh, smoking opium and stuff like this. So this part of decadency is also involved in that picture. I would like to show you one thing about Shang dynasty. They de uh, developed several types of currency. But in order to explain why and how China started to use currency, it's Actually, we need to have some kind of introduction. The first type of currency I'm going to show you is actually related to agriculture. And during the Shang Dynasty, it's, it's good enough to say that the China was growing food for thousands of years. The, the agriculture was very well developed. And mass, massive surplus of that production was actually spent on a divination, on a rituals that were taking place pretty much every 10 days. And during those rituals, they, were, they sacrificed a huge amounts of food and grain, and up to 600 cows to the ancestors. And that was absolutely the regular thing to maintain the order of the, of, the, of the power, to ask ancestors every week, every time, about their opinion about different matters. Um, the most staple grain of Shang Dynasty is millet. Later on, we have soya. Rice becomes more popular during Han Dynasty 800 years ago. And when it comes to land administration, the most common problem was locust um, grass hoopers flying around. But we, has, uh, what, but we have also uh, an evidence that the Shang Dynasty uh, started to burn the fields to get rid of that. So they are getting more into being more uh, 
um, aggressively combating the problem. The first type of money is the bull money, because uh, before 1200 BC, farming equipment, spades, machetes, knives, uh, were used as a medium of trade barter exchange, and this is how the first form of money arrived. It was uh, so-called spade money. In the second segment, the Shan kings were pre after divination, after fortune telling, they were um, uh, preoccupied with hunting and supervi supervision of the pastures because the nobility in China was allowed to have a huge pastures when they kept the whole menagerie of different animals. And the higher you were in rank, the bigger pastures were. So you had the whole army of officials supervising the harvest, supervising the hunting games. And uh, uh, the, uh, the Shan kings a favorite uh, topic of, of, of hunting games was the elephants. In the Henan, we have uh, evidence that the elephants were present, that they could kill up to 10 elephants during one party. Uh, they also hunted tigers, wild boars, and everything that was moving around. Um, and um, uh, by, the very long, uh, by, by the very late Shang periods, the majority of the time, the Shang king spent on just pretty much hunting and... and uh, performing the rituals regarding the, the cult of ancestors. But there was one segment of Bronze Age economy in China, fishing. And fishing was very popular among uh, middle class people, especially fishing with the cormoran. You can see on this picture a guy uh, keeping the birds to, to do the job for him. And in a Chinese tradition, the fish is, is considered to be a very lucky thing because the sound yu is actually very similar to the sound of, of the character luck. And the fish was considered to be very, very good to have because they breed fast so you can get the good, good stuff and fast. So we have another type of currency also during Shang Dynasty. We have the fish money, the yu money, ingots in the a, in a form of, of uh, fish. Shang commerce and economy went much further. The Shang kings were the first ones who actually built the road systems. But they were also very much interested in the building canals and the watering of the, of the ter territory because during the Bronze Age, China was much hotter and much wetter than, uh, than it is today. So we have a massive um, labor works regarding the building of the channels. And they are all, uh, we can see that they are interested in building waterways to the places where the salt or the copper is available. So they want to maintain the metal production. But we have also huge cities. The city of Anyang, 250,000 people. Uh, the city of Gang, probably 100,000 people. A slave class, a middle class, a nobility class. So very highly advanced society. And, uh, and in that society, a number of different currencies. On this diagram, you can see uh, various types of Bronze Age Chinese money, all related to Shang, uh, to Shang Dynasty. On the one hand side, we have spade money, the one I've mentioned, that go into that agriculture theme. We have fish money. Uh, I mentioned that, that the fishing was involved. We have also bridge money, which are, um, which are coming back from the taxation uh, duties during crossing the bridges that were owned by the king. So you had to, uh, this is another form of proto-currency. We have a very interesting form of knife money, which goes back to something I didn't talk about, it is wool making. So basically, Chinese farmers were also, they had to sh shave the goats, uh, or the sheep, and the wool was very expensive. So along the way, the knife that you were using to, to cut off the wool was also used as a replacement of the, in a transaction way. And the most common uh, known um, since ne the Neolithic was the crowdies, the, the shells. In the Neolithic and Xia period, we have a regular normal shells being exchanged, but during the Shang dynasty, they are made of metal. So this is, there's a replica of money. And looking at that mess, looking at that transitional period in the history of China, what is the basic uh, what could be the basic conclusion? The basic conclusion is that the great, great variety in proto currency impedes unification and economic expansion of the Chinese state. So basically, when you have too many currencies, when you have too many languages, then you have a big problem. And if they cannot really overlap, one system is equally 
uh, good as the other one, you can stay in that state for hundreds of years. And that indeed happens in China. They start to unify the country during the Han Dynasty, 800 years later. And the Han Dynasty does one thing, actually two things. They introduce one common grain, rice, which China is famous for today, and they introduce one type of currency. The currency sometimes you can see in Chinese shops. This is the first uniform form of money that is accepted by all, all stateless and all classes of growing economic giants. Thank you very much.